And welcome back to Alaska Public Television's Debate for the State. I'm John Tracy. We go now to the only face-to-face -face debate between the two major party candidates for U.S. Senate. Incumbent Ted Stevens has represented Alaska in the U.S. Senate since 1968. He is the longest-serving Republican in the Senate. Democrat Mark Begich is the mayor of Anchorage. He has served as mayor of Alaska's largest city since 2003. Welcome to both of you tonight. And reintroducing tonight's panel, longtime Alaska journalists Larry Persily and Michael Carey. And thank you as well to our studio audience. For the candidates, I will tell you how much time you have to respond to each question. It will typically be one minute unless I tell you otherwise. They will vary from segment to segment. When you hear this sound, nice job. That is the bell. That means your time is up. Now, to help pace yourselves, we have three lights next to Larry. You can see them there. When you see the green light, you're allowed to keep speaking. You have time left. When you see the yellow light, that means you have 10 seconds left. And when you have the red light, that means we are just seconds away from the dreaded bell. So, that said, let's begin with our first question to Senator Stevens. And Michael, you have the question. Senator Stevens, good evening. Um, Senator Stevens, though this will be a traditional debate most of the evening, there are some questions that only you can answer. After your conviction Monday on seven felony counts, you said that you would talk to Alaskans about your future and the future of Alaska. Senator McCain and Governor Palin have asked you to step down in the meantime while you pursue your appeal. If Governor Palin and Senator McCain were in this room, what would you say to them? Well, first thing I would tell them is that the case is still pending on the basis of motions we filed for a new trial or for uh, a dismissal of the case because of prosecutorial misconduct. It, I have not been convicted of anything. I would tell them that uh, I understand that they make statements to turn the, the heat of a campaign uh, and uh, probably they've been a mis little misinformed by their staff, but I, I wouldn't hold it against them. I understand what they're doing. They're trying to get elected, and I've just uh, say, you know, John and, and Sarah, uh, I understand you. Larry? Senator Stevens, you are asking Alaskans to reelect you while you fight to overturn the jury's verdict. Meanwhile, your own party's leader in the Senate, Kentucky Senator Mitch McConnell, has called on you to resign. As effective as you have been for Alaska over your career, what can you do to ensure that effectiveness will continue if reelected? Well, I think you ought to just look at what's done, been done since the trial was going on. As a matter of fact, we passed a series of bills that uh, I had introduced uh, and had to go back to the, to the Senate while the trial was going on. I, I think I'll be effective. Uh, effectiveness is a matter of experience. Uh, and as far as the leader's comments, he too is up for election. They just wanted to get away from questions from the press about the situation. So they made the comments about, well, maybe you should step down. I'm not going to step down. I have not been convicted. I have, I have got a case pending against me, and probably the worst case of prosecutorial the, the misconduct by the prosecutors that is known. I had a talk this afternoon with one of the attorneys here, his former U.S. attorney, who told me he was appalled at what went on in that case. So I think you'll find out. I will succeed, and I'll be, be found innocent. Can I follow up? Yeah, um, certainly. Senator, are you suggesting that your critics in the Congress are just, your Republican critics are just insincere and trying to win an election and they're just saying what's convenient? I think that to a great extent they are. Thank hey, you. Yeah, you want me to hold it against them? That's up to you. I don't. Mayor Begich, you get a question. Thank you. <laughs> your website says that you will stand up against government intrusion into the lives of Alaskans. Can you give any specific examples of federal government intrusion into the lives of Alaskans that you would change once you get to the Senate? Well, I think there's a couple pieces of legislation that passed. When you look at the uh, FISA legislation that passed recently, which I would not have supported, I think the uh, immunity that telecoms received uh, in the sense of that they can tap your phones without uh, any recourse by people who believe their civil rights were violated, I think would be a problem. Uh, the real ID card, for example, that they, the Senate wants to pass, I know Senator Stevens supports that. I do not support that. Um, I can go through kind of a shopping list of issues. But the, when you look at what's going on in Washington, D.C., I think they have picked away at our civil liberties, our rights, and our constitutional rights as they see that they think and they talk about it as important for homeland security. I'm very strong on homeland security, but they should not be taking, picking away at our constitutional rights, which I believe several of these pieces of legislation have done. 
Senator Stevens, I'm going to let you weigh in on that if, you, if you'd like to. Uh, whether or not you feel that there are, are uh, examples of federal government intrusion into the lives of Alaskans? Well, I've just had a little myself, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I do think that uh, the mayor is a little bit off base. The laws we passed were passed with a strong uh, uh, bipartisan majority uh, to try and protect the people of the United States. The phones that were tapped were, were phones carrying calls from outside the United States in order to, to uh, that was following the 9-11 concepts. As far as the real ID, the real ID really is a concept to try and pre uh, to, to deal with a situation where people either have to have a passport or some kind of identification with them. It'd be much better to have a real uh, identification uh, so that it would be acceptable anywhere. Uh, tr try going into a federal court, for instance, if you want to do it right now. I've tried that in recent years, re recent days, and I've got to tell you, you have to have an ID. Well, you have to have an ID almost anywhere in the world today. And, and this concept of real ID is, is something I think we should look at. Thank you, gentlemen. Michael? Um, Senator Stevens, um, earlier this year, Senator John Warner of Virginia, your colleague, announced he was retiring. In his statement to the Washington Post and to others, he said, quoting Thomas Jefferson, there is a fullness in time when men should go and not occupy the ground too long. You've achieved virtually anything a man could achieve here in Alaska in 40 years in the Senate and a long career in public life. Don't Jefferson's words apply to you as well? Wouldn't it be time to give a younger person a chance? Well, I'll tell you, I know John well. I know he's not well. I'm well. I'm in better shape now than I've been for many years, as a matter of fact. And as far as that's concerned, I knew Carl Hayden, who served well into his long years. I knew the senator from... Uh, Rhode Island, who served, Teddy Green, who served well into his years, Senator Strom Thurmond. Uh, why, why put a time limit on ability? I'm firm, firmly capable of serving, and right now the state needs me. We're about ready to enter into a recession, maybe even a depression. And, and this state is supported to a great extent by federal activities. Almost 40% of the jobs in this state are directly related to, to, to annual appropriations. Now. Why, why would you want to send a, a new person down to try and enter into the, that field, a person with no experience at all? I've got the experience, I've got the know-how, and I've got the ability and the health. Why, why should I step down? Well, I, feel, I, will, I feel like serving, and I'll, I'll go run a mile with you if you like to do that. <laughs> Thank you very much. I want to answer that question. I'll let Mr. Begich answer it, Mayor Begich. <laughs> Mayor Begich, the power in the Senate is, as the senator has described it, essentially uh, built on seniority. How are you going to be an effective senator if you have no seniority? Uh, and don't give us the answer that you, you're going to walk acro work across party lines because we've already heard that about 15 times. Well, you're going to hear it again to a certain extent. But I do want to say one thing early on, and I, and I understand what Senator Stevens said there with all due respect when he made the comment that, he, you know, that, that the issue of his conviction, he is convicted. And this is an issue. When you think about what the minority leader said, and that is, the minority leader said very clearly that there's a 100% probability he will not be serving. He will be expelled from the Senate. I, I take these folks at their word. They're out there telling people, broadcasting. What am I going to do? I think my experience is very broad-based. From a, as a mayor, as an assembly member, a small business person, someone who clearly understands how to reach across party lines. I have done that all my life in political service. And it is the way that Washington, D.C. needs to change. The way it is in Washington, D.C. now is very partisan, very one-sided. If you're not this, you're that. And that is the problem that has gotten us into this economic crisis that we're facing, this energy crisis we're facing, this health care crisis. You can put crisis after every issue that Congress is dealing with because of the partisan bickering that goes on back there. And that is part of the solution. You have to get in there and understand that there are people that are going to disagree with you and not demonize them, as Senator Stevens has done time and time again. Thank Mayor, you. Mayor Begich, I have not, I'm just going to follow up to your, to your question because of the way you first started answering the question. I've not heard you uh, come out as strongly as you just did. I guess I will ask you directly, yes or no, do you think Senator Stevens should resign? I think it's up to him to make that final call, but I have said that I believe, you know, that this state can do better. There's no question. As we move to November 4th, I've campaigned about the issues, talked about what's important. But it's clear to me, as I see every Republican in the leadership position saying that he will be expelled from the Senate if he gets elected, Alaska has to look to its future, look to what we're going to do and the issues we need to deal with. As I mentioned just, just a second ago with Michael, 
The issues we face are amazing. When you think of the energy crisis, the economic crisis, but worrying about someone's trial and appeal will distract from the issues that we face in this state. And we need to get busy and get on with the show. And I truly believe that I will do a better job and be at the, at the front door running and working hard every single day. I think Senator Stevens has some serious issues he will have to deal with and will distract him from the work that we need to do in this country and in this state. I don't believe I got an answer I, to my question. Well, I, 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 that's for him to decide, and he's made that very clear. He's, he's not going to step down, so we will make that decision November 4th. My belief is uh, we will be successful, and that step down will occur. Senator, would you like the last word? Well, I sure would, because 100% uh, of my colleagues have not asked me to step down. A few of them running for election have. I've had conversations with many senators who have called me personally. One, one uh, I think, to be really the best informed lawyer in the Senate called me and said he had read the, my attorney's letter to, to, to the Attorney General and I should stay, absolutely stay, because th th this matter has to be investigated and what's more, it, w it would take a two-thirds vote not to seat me. If I'm elected by the people of Alaska, I'm the Alaska senator and it, it would take two-thirds vote of the Senate to not seat me. This business about not seating me is, is, is wrong. They, it, they're not going to reject me in the Senate. I, I have a great standing across the aisle, and, and we want to talk about going across the aisle. I, I don't think there's any senator uh, uh, sitting right now that has the friendships that I do across the, across the aisle. Uh, I think my friendship with, with Senator Noy is, is, is really one of great history, and it will continue. He called me this morning and said, you know, keep fighting. We need to be this, have our team together, and I'm going to try to keep it together. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, gentlemen. And now for a perspective from rural Alaska and one of your younger constituents. This student at the Bethel Alternative Boarding School has a question for both Senator Stevens and Mayor Baggage. Is what are your position on U.S. troop deployment all over the world as security forces and humanitarian missions? In case you couldn't hear that in the studio, uh, the way. I can't even see that. Yeah, De I'll repeat Dean's question here. He asked, what is your position on U.S. troop deployment all over the world as security forces and humanitarian missions? Senator? Well, my position is, is that we have a necessity to protect our interests abroad and particularly protect uh, uh, Americans when they are abroad. And I, we do have troops stationed, I think, now in 146 different countries. Uh, and Senator Noah and I have been to many of them to see how they're treated and whether they should be there. I support the concept of really having troops deployed ab abroad when we have interests that should be protected. Mayor Baggage. Yeah, I don't necessarily disagree with that. I think one of our problems is right now our troops are stretched to the max with the war in Iraq and where our troops are there. We don't have enough resources in the war in the, in the issue of Afghanistan and Pakistan. And I think one of our biggest struggles is going to be how do we ensure that we have enough troops and services available to ensure that we can do when there's a moment in time of humanitarian aid that we need to ensure. So one of our biggest problems is you know, making sure we have troops available. That's our biggest challenge. I agree that we need to make sure when we, put, when we need our security forces working and aggressively out there, it's an important part. Alaska is, you know, when you think about where Alaska sits as a military uh, component in the sense of 88 plus thousand veterans that live here, some incredible bases here that supply needs across this globe. But our biggest challenge is going to be what are we going to do to increase the capacity and make sure we have the troops available to ensure that we can do these humanitarian aid issues. I'd like to follow Dean's question with a lightning round uh, on questions surrounding the Iraq War. I'd ask you to keep your answers to about 15 seconds if you could. Uh, this question is simply, will the U.S., in your opinion, have a major military presence in Iraq five years from now? Mayor Begich. I don't believe so. I think there's clear indication that we're now winding down and moving our troops and getting ready to move our troops. I think the biggest issue is going to be Afghanistan and Pakistan over the several years. Senator Stevens, will we still be there? I think we'll have some presence there, but it'll be advisory only. But I, uh, we had troops in Europe for, what, 50 years? I think we'll be there on an advisory basis. It's the only d democracy in that part of the world. Michael? Okay, this will go to Senator Stevens first, and then we'll go to Mayor Begich. Knowing what you know now, do you think the, <clears throat> the country of Iraq and Saddam Hussein played a role in the 9-11 attacks on the United States, starting with you, Senator? I, I know more than you think I know, and I do believe they did. Thank you. Mr. Begich. Uh, I don't believe they did. All right, Larry, you have the next question. Yes, we'll go to Mayor Begich first. 
There is an ongoing debate in the presidential race over diplomacy with our foreign enemies. Recently, General Petraeus recommended that the United States open channels with the Taliban in Afghanistan. Do you agree with that move, Mayor Begin? You know, I, I think that would be a... I think we have to be very cautious. I think we have some issues, obviously, in Afghanistan and obviously in Afghanistan and Pakistan in the sense of what we're having to do with the Taliban going back and forth in Al-Qaeda. I think our issue, uh, I'm not sure I would agree 100 percent. I think we have to be very cautious in how we approach this issue. Uh, we have had uh, in Afghanistan, again, as I said earlier, not a very strong uh, enough resources there. So I, I'm not sure I would 100 percent agree, but I would listen to the military advisors, and if they come to the conclusion that that's the right approach, we're going to have to uh, consider that as very strong advice. Thank you. Senator Stevens. I think General Petraeus is right. The Taliban, uh, I think, has been reinfected, so to speak, by the al-Qaeda people. Uh, it, it is entirely possible that we could reestablish with, uh, with the Taliban uh, what, General, uh, what President Carsey had already tried to do, and that was to uh, really bring them back into the fold. Uh, I, I think uh, General Petraeus is one of the finest officers we have. He reminds me of Eisenhower to a great extent. He's willing to step out and really take action, and I, I, I would follow his advice on this. I think the country should follow his advice right now. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. We're now going to shift gears and talk about energy. And this is a question for both of you. The high cost of energy is being felt in Alaska more severely than elsewhere in the country. I know you both have ideas for sustainable energy, which is the long-term solution. But when Alaskans are paying 80 cents more than the average driver in the lower 48 for a gallon of gas, when we pay more for gasoline than drivers in Hawaii, there seems to be little doubt that we are being gouged. And in rural Alaska, the cost of energy is multiplied to a point where the very survival of some, question, uh, some villages is in question. Is there anything you can do from Washington to bring Alaska's energy costs in line with the rest of the country now? And I'll begin with you, Senator. Well, there is, but I think you have to address the fact here at home first, because we sell our crude oil. We ha we're entitled to one-eighth of that crude oil that's coming through the pipeline. We sell it at the highest price in the country absolutely the highest price and then on top of it we put onto some readjustments for mistakes that were made 18 years ago we're, we're, the state is almost closed down the flint hills refinery because of these past uh, builds that are bringing forward now and the current generation have to pay for mistakes of state employees 18 years ago we passed a federal bill that limits that to eight years as far as getting to the question of how to do this though i think we, the federal government the state ought to work towards establish a regime whereby areas that produce oil should not have to pay such a high price to consume it. Now, we, we've, we've, we must have some way to adjust that. Uh, I, I think another thing we have to do is find some way to have regional refineries. Uh, you know, we own the ferry system, we own the railroad. Why can't we own some regional refineries and help people get uh, oil, gasoline and fuel oil at a reasonable price? I, I think we can work together to do that on the state and federal government. And I've had talks along my, that line the last two, two or three months. Thank you. Mayor Begich. I think there's some things you can do very quickly. I, I think one of the issues with refinery capacity is one of the pieces of the equation. The other is, you know, when you look at the energy issue, one of the parts is the demand and trying to get the demand down. You know, one other piece is the oil speculators. Oil speculators have added probably 30 percent to the cost, and regulating them is going to be critical in ensuring that we make sure that they're not just speculating on the backs of consumers. I know one of the issues that Senator Stevens supported back in 2000 and 2002 was allowing these, these uh, oil speculators to do whatever they want, no regulation, and cost to Alaskans is $1.5 billion to the consumer. I think that's one thing we can do very quickly. But the bigger picture, we would not be here if we had a, an energy plan in this country. 40, 30 years ago, we should have been working on it to make sure today we would not be in this crisis. When you look at the issues that we face, we don't have enough oil production, gas production, alternative energy, renewable energy. We should be on the cutting edge in this country, and we're not. On the issues of conservation and demand side, we should be able to have the best technology, and we're not. This is one issue that I'm going to work on very aggressively to ensure we have a real energy policy for this country. Thank you, gentlemen. Larry? Still on energy. TransCanada would like the U.S. Treasury to help underwrite the construction cost overrun and shipping contract risks of a North Slope natural gas pipeline. Do you support the company's proposals? Why or why not? Mayor Begich, start with you. I, I don't support them. And I, I think the idea of that the federal government would basically be the bridge between them getting customers and them building it, I think the first thing they should be able to do is, as they're getting ready to build that line, make sure they have the customers to fill it. Why should we come in in the middle of it? I think the gas line is a very important project uh, for us here in the state, 
but also for this country. It will provide gas not only across this country, making sure we have between four and four, four and six percent additional gas supply for our country, but also the potential for in-state use, which is a critical part of this gas line. As this gas line has been talked about, one of the pieces I think is missing is ensuring that we have in-state use for consumers in this state. Instead, the gas line is being talked about just moving it to the lower 48, which is important for the long-term national uh, issues of gas and energy. But we need to make sure we have in-state use. Thank you, Senator Stevens. Well, as far as the mayor's comment about uh, in-state use, we ought to build the, the Gubik line, the, the, the bullet line for our in-state use, and we ought to build the, the Alaska gas pipeline to take that gas to the markets in the Middle, middle West. Uh, I do think that uh, the Canadian country, the company is wrong. Uh, as a matter of fact, they came to me on that, and then I told them it was wrong. And I went down and, and met with the Office of Management and Budget and the Department of Energy, and they also said it was wrong. They, we, we would never countenance that. We were very lucky to get the $18 billion uh, loan guarantee that we already have that applies to the line and would apply to a portion that goes through uh, Canada. Even, that was very criticized. Uh, uh, many people criticized us at, about, on that at the time. But as far as the, the concept of, of in-state use, we have an opportunity right here. We ought to be start, start to, to try to develop our, our coal bed methane. We ought to develop the Gubit gas field. We've got the ability to build the, the bullet line uh, even before the Alaska gas line starts. The way the Alaska gas line's been delayed, it's probably not off to about 2018. We could build a bullet line before that, many years before that. Thank you. Michael. Okay. <clears throat> um, my question, uh, first, qu uh, we'll start with Senator Stevens. You will be up first, sir. Uh, for both of you, we've heard for more than two decades that opening Anwar to oil drilling is just around the corner. Why should we believe that anymore, especially given that both presidential candidates in this race are against opening Anwar, and the Senate, with more Democrats, is about to become even more anti-opening Anwar? Senator well, you used the right phrase at the end because we had a guarantee from Senator Jackson, Senator Songus, when they helped us get the amendment that put aside a million and a half acres on the Arctic for oil and gas exploration and development, that we'd have bipartisan support to build that line. Unfortunately, uh, the good Lord took them from us, and since that time, the Democratic Party has opposed uh, the concept of building uh, th that line. I, I, I really think that what we've got to do is find some way to, to, to deal with the situation. Uh, I, I, I don't know how you, you get around this, though, in terms of uh, sending a, a, another Democrat down to, to join those who are already opposed us. If they have 60 votes, if they can stop, if, if they can stop any debate uh, concerning that one provision that allows us to explore that million and a half acres of the Arctic, they will repeal that. There's already a bill been introduced to repeal that. Uh, they know there's a guarantee right now in the state of Alaska we can develop the resources of that area, of, of the Anwar area. It, it really has never been, that area has never been closed to oil and gas development. It would be closed if the Democrats got 60 votes. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Mr. Mayor Begich. Yeah, first, I want to respond to that last comment. His assumption is, if I'm one of those 60, which I think would be very difficult for them to get to 60 at this point, but his assumption is that I would sell out Alaska for whatever national Democrat he's referring to, or national Democrat, that is outrageous. You know, it, there's no way over my dead body they're going to get that repeal if that ever happens. I'm going to be fighting double time. But the issue of Anwar, we have made it a Democrat-Republican issue where we shouldn't have. This is an issue that should be talked about from an energy standpoint for this country. It's in Alaska. It's an important project for us, Anwar, drilling in Anwar, but it is a national energy policy. It needs to be part of the energy plan. I think that's how you have to repackage this and, and put it down on the table. In the Senate right now, in the Republican energy plan, Anwar is not part of it. When you look at the national platform of the Republican Party, it's not in there any longer. They're no longer listening to Ted Stevens on this issue. And I think I can come forward with a different type of approach that's part of a long-term energy plan for our country, that Anwar is part, part of that equation as long as well as renewable energy, conservation. It's a combination of things. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. We're going to go back now to rural Alaska for our next question. And it's being posed by Bethel resident Will Updegrove. Senator Byrd of West Virginia carries a copy of the U.S. Constitution in his coat pocket at all times. If you serve Alaska for the next six years as senator, what will you do to assure that the constitutional balance of powers is maintained and to guard the authority of the Congress against the encroachments of the executive branch? Mayor Begich, you have the first response. 
Well, I think that's an important role. I mean, I, sitting as mayor, I have a strong mayor, former government, executive branch, as well as when I served on the legislative branch. I think part of the equation is uh, to ensure that uh, we are working with the administration, understanding where the differences are and what our job is in the sense of appropriations and making sure generation of legislation. They have jobs of regulation and making sure they're implemented. Uh, but it is a careful balance. I've served on both ends, so I clearly understand the role of a legislative body in an executive branch. And it is one that, at times, you look at what's going on in Washington, D.C., they cross over a little too much. And we end up getting in fights between Congress and the executive, executive branch. And I think there's some great opportunities, from my experience, to ensure those two, and I've been there on both ends, and see clearly how to make sure those two, two ends are separate and what their jobs are. I know I have this battle once in a while with my Anchorage Assembly, understanding what my role is as a strong executive and understanding what their role is as a legislative body. Senator Stevens. Well, that's a very good question, and I'm glad you asked it because, you know, I sit across the aisle from Senator Byrd, and we talk almost every day about the Constitution. He does carry it in his pocket. I did serve on the Bicentennial Com Commission on the com of the uh, Constitution, and I, I think that it's, it's something we should pay, pay more attention to. The, the, the whole concept of the Constitution is, is one of really uh, a, a, a sharing of powers by the states. We used to talk about these United States and, and not instead of the United States. The whole concept has changed in recent years now so that the, the, the federal government has ex extraordinary power and that power is primarily uh, re re really in, in the executive branch, which I think is very unfortunate. And I think that's one of the reasons we should keep, uh, we should understand what it means to keep people around like Senator Byrd, like myself, like Senator Noy, like the people who have served there for a while, who understand that constitution, understand the meaning of the balance of power, and understanding the meaning of abuse of power by the executive branch. We watch that all the time. Right now, let's turn to the economy. This is a question for both of you. We'll begin with you, Mayor Begich. Congress approved the $700 billion rescue plan for Wall Street. Now there's talk of using a portion of that money, up to $50 billion worth, to refinance the mortgages of those who gambled on subprime loans and now cannot afford to make their monthly payments. Do you support using federal dollars to absorb those losses and keep people in their homes? I think first on the bill itself, I think there was major problems when that bill finally passed it did not take care of what I believe working families, everyday families. I think it took care of Wall Street, made sure people who had golden parachutes walked away without paying a dime and making sure uh, that at the end of the day the taxpayers are paying this. As we're learning now, they're taking some of the money that's going to banks and buying other banks as well as uh, paying dividends. Some of these banks are now paying dividends to their shareholders rather than putting it into the market. I think the issue of the subprime, uh, subprime loans that individuals have uh, we're going to have to deal with this issue. So if we have to put some money aside to help refinance these, these uh, mortgages, we're going to have to deal with it some way. And I, so I don't necessarily oppose that. The reality is, if we don't deal with these, they're going to come back on our laps anyway, because some of these are insured, and we need to make sure that we are getting properly managed loans. And I think putting the $50 billion out there will help keep these from ending up in our laps. But this is a huge and significant problem, and so there are multifacets to deal with this. Senator, should this be a good use for this money? Well, that's sort of a simplistic way to put it, the mayor put it. I've got to tell you, the impact of what we're facing, as I said in the beginning, of a recession and perhaps a depression, ought to be really looked at. Look at our permanent fund. It lost $5.5 billion in a period of about three weeks. Uh, the, the, the bill we passed was to start the process of trying to stabilize the, the value of mortgages in this country. Like it or not, our mortgages now in packages have become an international investment t tool. It's, it, some of those mortgages, the packages were held in other countries and have caused other countries' markets to, 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 to fall or at least to splinter. Now, I think we, ha we have the duty to try and find some way to follow the lead of trying to shore up that market and try to understand what it means to do that. Uh, the, instantly, Freddie Mae and Fannie, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they abuse their power too. That's another situation of abuse of power and it should be greater oversight. We had a Republican bill to do that. It was stopped by the Democrats three times. So chairman Shelby, when he was chairman of the bank committee, wanted to stop that. But when you look at it, what we're doing today is to try and find some way to, to keep the mortgage values up, 
despite the fa by the way, some of those mortgages were current. Most of them were current. There's only a few of the subprimes that have not been current. The problem isn't the currency. The problem is the decreasing value of, of, the, of the home beneath the mortgage. So it's actually was less value than the mortgage itself. I, I support the concept of supporting that mortgage market so that it won't fall again. As if it falls again, we're going to slide into at least a, 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 a recession, if not a depression. Sorry. At, the, at the same time, well, I, I, let me ask a follow-up if I can. What, what do you say to those Americans? Because there is some resentment in America for those who did not gamble with their mortgages and actually purchased properties that they could truly afford. What do you say to them? Well, well first off, I, 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 it's a great question, John, because as a mayor, one thing I, I know in my work nationally with mayors all across this country, I hear from mayors that are having significant problems in their communities where a house ne next door maybe is now in default foreclosure, falling apart in their house, which they're paying their mortgage on, values dropping. As soon as you have these foreclosures occurring within a neighborhood, the valuations of the whole neighborhood start dropping. So it's in our best interest, if we are going to maintain the valuations, is to ensure that we're not having these massive foreclosure problems. So it's a community issue. The other thing, and Senator Stevens, it is not a simplistic answer. I think the issue I just dealt with this Tuesday night at the Anchorage Assembly, we have a massive port project going on. We used to be able to get commercial paper for our port. We're a highly rated city in the sense of the credit markets that we could get commercial paper loans for nine months and then roll them every nine months. But now because of the market, we can only get it for every seven days. It costs us more money because the stimulus bill in part is not going to where it should go, creating liquidity in the markets. What instead it's doing, it's making sure bonuses are still being paid, dividends are still being paid, uh, making sure that people uh, in the sense of the market is not doing what, in my view, and I live in it every day as a mayor of this city, we have a great credit rating here, but we can't get the liquidity even with this bill that has passed. Senator, I'll remind you of my, my follow-up. What do you say to those who, who actually are paying their mortgages and, and didn't gamble on these types of mortgages? Well, I tell them we're trying to do our best to see to it that the value of your, your house remains and you won't be one that's, uh, that is affected by the next slide. You know, that this is something that could well slide into a recession, as I said, and then it comes to the Depression. What we've tried to do is to shore it up. Now, there have been a series of things that have done. Some things have been here, said here today are wrong. We, the, the money we put up for, for, for to fix the mortgage package has not been used off in doing some of these other things like uh, Freddie uh, Mac and, and Fannie Mae, or, or like the uh, uh, loan to AIG. Th those were different things by the Federal Reserve and by other things. They all amount to, by the way, risking taxpayers' money. But the, the real problem is we have now become part of a global economy, and, 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 and uh, I want to go back to the concept of speculators. I did not uh, oppose, uh, uh, you know, propose some concept about freeing up speculators. Senator Feinstein and I were the one that ended the speculation and the recent situation as far as speculation in, in the paper that represents oil futures. But this thing right now is, is confidence. If you want to have confidence in your government, you should understand we have to find some way to prevent this from getting worse. And that's, that's why I voted for that bill. Thank you, gentlemen. Larry, you have the next question. Supporters of a second economic stimulus package want to spend billions of dollars, federal dollars, on construction jobs, unemployment benefits, food stamps, home heating subsidies, and Medicaid. Are there any items on that list that you would not support in a legislative package if you do support a second stimulus yeah, package? What? Well, you're talking about the House bill, some, uh, uh, you know, Speaker Pelosi's bill, which is some dream out there or some staff. I don't think even she has supported that yet. But uh, I certainly do not support that. As a matter of fact, I support mechanisms to try. Uh, my, my friends around here seem to complain about the fact that getting Anwar started, for instance. If we could find some way to stop sending so much money offshore, almost a half a trillion dollars a year, we, we, we bring substances back into this country and burn them up. We, don't, we have nothing invested as a result of our, our earnings that we sent offshore to buy oil and energy. Now, we've got to stop that. Soon, we're going to be, support, we're going to be importing 40% of our natural gas in another five years. Now, unless we stop that by starting the process of developing our domestic resources, we're going to be in trouble. E even Pre President Candidate Obama mentioned this concept the other day, that w w it's the idea of domestic production ought to be at the forefront of our minds. We ought to find some way to develop the income we need to, for things you mentioned without going in further into debt. I, would, I do not support that bill. I, don't, I think there's a lot of good things we ought to try to do, but not with additional taxpayers' money at this time. Thank you.
Mayor Berkowitz. Or <laughs> Mayor Baggage. <laughs> starts with same a B. Chair, it's, it's <laughs> same chair. Same chair starts with a B, I understand. Uh, first, I want to uh, correct something that Senator Stevens said. Uh, you know, the Enron Amendment that when he was chair of the Appropriations Committee, it was a rider that was put on there. He had control over the bill. It allowed the speculators to be deregulated. In 2002, a bill came forward that allowed him, that, uh, that could have stopped this speculation. He voted against it. Now, He's now talking about it after eight years, and it costs Alaskans $1.5 billion. But on the issue of this, on the idea of stimulus bill, this is a piece they missed in this whole uh, package in the, in when they put the bill forward, and that is when they did the bailout bill, and that is they should have had a stimulus package that focused on infrastructure. Something I know, when I was, became mayor in 2003, we dealt with a huge budget deficit. We also moved forward on infrastructure investment. Because you need to invest in water and sewer and roads and infrastructure like uh, electrification and transmission lines. Because if the government puts that money into that and invests in good infrastructure, the private sector will see that we are committed to moving our economy forward. When those dollars come forward, the private sector moves their dollars forward and the economy keeps moving. That's what we did here in Anchorage. That's why Business Week ra rated us as one of the few cities that will survive this recession and survive this economic chaos we're in. Thank you, gentlemen. Michael? Okay, this will be for both of you, and this time uh, Mayor Begich will go first. <clears throat> Many people believe the Wall Street crisis was in good measure the result of failed regulation. Alan Greenspan himself says that he put too much faith in the marketplace to do what was right. Did President Bush and the Congress together both fail as regulators and contribute to the Wall Street and financial debacle? Mayor Begich. I think the simple answer is yes, and it's Democrats and Republicans. I know earlier Senator Stevens wanted to blame the Democrats on the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. It, both of them are part of the equation, because in theory they're looking at the whole issue of regulation and what they should be doing. I think it clearly was a fault of both, both the Democrats and Republicans in Congress and the Bush administration. They took their eye off the ball. The net result was they said, you know, we'll voluntarily regulate ourselves, and that, they allowed that to occur. Well, they did voluntarily regulate themselves into golden parachutes. Just in 2006, they were able to pay bonuses over $60 billion in these companies. And now we're paying the bill for it. So I think Congress did not do their job. And it's both Republicans and Democrats who are at fault here. And we should have had a better eye on it in the sense of regulation. Senator Stevens. Well, you know, the, the real problem about this is that when, when you look at what happened uh, with hindsight, and I know Alan Greenspan very well, played tennis with him. What he did, he didn't quite say what you said he said. He said that the model that he supported had failed. And, when, and I, I heard his, his testimony, by the way. And when, when you look at that, that, that is a, a admission that we, we rely too much on these concepts of models and putting, uh, putting uh, the whole fabric of government regulation tied to models. And I think we have learned something from this. One of the things we have to learn is the models we make for our own economy today won't work if we're part of a global economy. We have to find ways to, to predict how, how the global economy is going to affect our own uh, economy here. And, and we, have, we have to shift our, all, our, our thinking about how we regulate. I do believe we're going into a period of greater regulation. The bill we passed, for instance, prohibits uh, the concepts of the, the, the golden parachutes. It requires increased oversight. We, we've gone your direction already in the bill that I voted for. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. We're going to speed things up a little bit right now with another series of lightning round questions. These are on totally unrelated topics. I'm going to ask you to keep your uh, answers to just 15 seconds. So, first question is, if elected and if it becomes necessary, is Governor Sarah Palin qualified to serve as President of the United States? Mayor Baggage. You know, I've answered this question a lot of times, and my view is uh, the voters are going to make that decision. If she wins her election as a vice presidential nominee, nominee as she is now, wins as vice president, uh, come November 4th, that will tell us the voters believe she's qualified. I'm going to come back. <laughs> Senator Stevens? Well, I don't understand your question in relation to his answer. So yeah, no, I, I said I'm going to come back, but I'm yeah. going to give you the chance well, first. What was the question now? Well, is, is, is Governor Palin qualified to serve as president? Yes, she is. Yes, she is. I think she is. She's had uh, experience on, uh, as a mayor. She's had experience really as a governor. And she is what I think the American women have sought for a long time. She's another candidate for, for a, a, a presence of a woman uh, in our national leadership. And so I think she's qualified. And I think uh, our people would like to see her become president, uh, vice president. I'd like to see her become president, as a matter of fact. 
Mr. Mayor, I'm going to insist on a yes or a no well, answer. Well, you know, John, on this one, I think, again, the voters are going to make the decision. I think she has proven that she has some strong metal out there. She's been out there on the campaign trail. I think the, the issue that I have not heard a lot about is where she stands on a lot of the foreign policy issues, domestic policy. I've heard her repeat more of the McCain line, but I'm interested in what she's about, and I have saw, saw some interviews with her, but they're not in depth and so I can't judge that at this point what I can tell you is she has made the nomination she will be there in the ticket on November 4th if she wins I guarantee you she's going to have to be ready and if she has to sit in the your your, your theory there is that something's going to happen to Senator McCain if he's president I mean that's what you're it's not my theory I simply asked you if you thought she was qualified to be president president well <laughs> she's running for vice president and she's on the ticket Michael Okay, um, this is for Senator Stevens first. Should Congress enact a progressive oil tax similar to the one the state of Alaska has? No. Thank you. Mayor Begich. And that's a good question. Um, I was asked this earlier today at uh, a forum I was at, and what I told them was, I think the issues of our natural resources, I'm not sure it's a progressive tax. I think the issue that we're now taxing our oil industry at uh, is fair. It seems our natural resources from the federal government side standpoint seems to be working. I think there's a great debate on should there be a windfall profit tax. I think that's the biggest debate, but the current taxes on our resources seem to be reasonable. I think one... I didn't realize it was a lightning round. So. It is a lightning oh, round. Okay. I'm sorry. Senator Stevens. I uh, already answered the question. Yeah. I'm sorry. Larry? I'll start with Mayor Begich. <laughs> Should the federal government continue to subsidize domestic production of corn-based ethanol at the rate of more than 50 cents a gallon? Um, I think we should have some subsidy in there as that develops, but here's the bigger issue, and that's the energy plan itself. You know, when every time we see a piece of legislation pass on the national level, it's, you know, pitting one state against another state, and really we should have a long-term energy plan that deals with all the renewable energies and alternative energies and have a real long-term plan, not just in one. Thank you. Senator Stevens. No, no, it's wrong to have it. The subsidy we have in production, and oh, there's also a tax in, uh, incentive tax credit even for the sale. So I, I think the current tax situation with regard to ethanol is wrong. It, it, it has really depressed, really, the ex exploration and development of domestic energy and natural, and I think it ought to stop. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. We're going to move on to the issue of health care. We spoke earlier about the proposal to rescue people from losing their homes due to mortgages. But who knows how many Americans have lost their homes, their life savings due to catastrophic illnesses, um, either, either through the lack of access to adequate medical insurance or the limited benefits that some of these plans provide. It's in, it's, it impacts all individuals. It impacts small businesses. It even impacts doctors and hospitals. It too, took two weeks to come up with a rescue plan for the mortgage industry and Wall Street. Should we deal, should we propose, would you, would you support the same sort of rescue plan when it comes to America's health care needs? Senator Stevens. Well, you know, it's sad, but I, I know one couple in this state that gave everything they had away in order to qualify for Medicaid. The, the parachute is there now for those people who don't have anything. The problem is, is for those who don't have, have a little bit left and have to sacrifice it in order to get the care they need. I, I do think we need to res review this now because, uh, because of the very high cost of the technology that we use, particularly for the elderly. I was told that the average American is going to spend as much in the last two years of his or her life as they've spent all the rest of their life. That's because of the advent of technology to keep us alive longer. And I, I think we have to look at this and try to figure out what to do about that. And I, I, uh, there, is, there is a problem there in terms of uh, ability to get the care. There's another problem in terms of how much care the taxpayers ought to support to maintain someone's life, who, which we, the good Lord is already calling them to, to leave us. I, I, that's a very difficult and religious question as far as I'm concerned. Mayor Baggage. Well, I think your question was, should we take the same zeal and energy that we did on the bailout bill, taking care of people on Wall Street, so instead working on families and issues of health care? The answer is simply yes. And I think some of the areas that are simple that we can work on, for example, with the Medicare uh, program, you are, we are restricted. The federal government is restricted from negotiating the best and lowest prices for prescription drugs. This is one that cost the Medicare program over $34 billion. This is an item that Senator Stevens supported. I think when you look at the issues of the wellness that needs to be added to the Medicare component, it could save us $9 billion. I think this issue of uh, dealing with uh, the health care is significant. 
you know, I, my wife and I were uninsured. We were or catastrophic insurance. We did not have insurance uh, for maternity when our son was born. But I think there are huge opportunities with the health care system. And the Medicare, Medicaid, VA program in the sense of delivery of services is dysfunctional. There are major problems that we need to revamp it in order to deliver better medical services and medical care. But also primary care doctors. Access to doctors is one of our largest and biggest challenges facing this next generation. Thank you. Michael? Okay, uh, and Mayor Begich will go first. One of the things that seems to make people mad when I talk to them is that they have a hard time getting insurance or medical care, and they say, look at Congress. Congress mm -hmm. has provided lifetime medical care for, them, for themselves. Should Americans get the same kind of medical care as the Congress of the United States? Actually, I've suggested a couple ideas for the small business community, because my wife's in the small business community, I have been in the small business community, and being able to access uh, affordable health care for our, our employees or any small business. You know, the backbone of this country is small businesses and they're having a hard time. What I've suggested is that we should open up the capacity of them to buy into the federal system, the federal system that Congress benefits from and hundreds of thousands of federal employees. Because once you do that, you share the risk, so therefore the prices are lower and the small business community can then supply and provide health care. The other thing, uh, I believe that health care in the general sense is that when you think of the small business community also, we are restricted by federal law that if you want to pool insurances. So in businesses from Alaska want to pool with Washington State, we are restricted by federal law. I think that law should be taken away and we should be able to pool and therefore provide a larger pool, lower cost to employees. But I think it's an incredible program that Congress has and that's why I've suggested some ideas of how we can, the average everyday person can access it and therefore lower their costs and spread their risk. Senator Stevens. Well, your premise is wrong, you know. We have the same insurance, uh, uh, health insurance as all government employees. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, my wife has uh, one policy from her law firm. I have a different one from, from the federal employee system. Uh, that's the same thing we provide for all federal employees. It's a contributory thing. We pay into it. It's not for life. It's, it's, it's there as long as you want to continue. When you retire, you then have the option of a retired em federal employee. But it, it, it is not something that's just special for Congress. I do believe we ought to try to find some way to, to broaden the concept so more Americans can have access to similar plans. The reason it is, is, is so good is because it's such a large plan. And, and when, you, when you come to an area that has a very no, small number of people, the plan for that, uh, that area has to bear the costs of, of, of medical for, for that area. So if you have one, one real bad situation, a high cost for one person, the cost for everybody goes up. We, we spread it over the, all of the, the, the federal government employees, and therefore the costs are very less. I agree with that, but it's because of the plan, not because something free for us. Larry, you have the next question. And this will go first to Senator Stevens. You've both had long, successful political careers, but which decisions do you wish you could do over? Is this one of those quickie things? No, you no. have one minute. No, <laughs> no. You, you can have a minute, Senator. Uh, well, I think I, I, the decision I would have, like to do over is uh, 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 a habit I got into of just trusting people. I really think uh, the, the trouble I'm in right now is because I trusted people. Uh, and I think uh, we ought to find some way to deal with the problems of being in office. For instance, as you know, I spend 20 days a year average at my place at Girdwood. Uh, and you know how many times I fly back and forth a, a year? About 20. How many times Senator Noy and I go overseas? About five to six a year. We, we, I, I would, uh, the decision I would make would be find some way uh, to, to make this a, a more, a, a, you know, accommodate it more to a family. Uh, I, th I think you probably see your grandchildren almost daily if, you're, if you, they live here. I see mine about twice a year. I think my decision, I think, would be to find some way to adjust my life so I'd spend more time with my family. Thank you, sir. Well, you know, this is one I actually, I don't know why I can never get it out of my mind. Um, and in 2003, when I ran for mayor, this similar question was asked, and I said it then, I thought I would never have to say it again. Uh, but it's the whole issue of photo radar. It was like a, 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 a dream that I should have just ignored the issue and moved on, but I thought it was a good idea back then. And I thought literally I would not have to ever bring this up again. And then I was at an event very recently 
and uh, Steve Haycox brought it up uh, again, and I said, why are you reminding the public about this issue that I want to get out of my mind? Uh, and he just smiled and says, because they need to be reminded when you make a mistake. Uh, but the issue on that is, not only is it important to acknowledge mistakes that you make, but it's what you do with them and what you learn from them. What I learned from that is not only is it important to hear and listen to constituencies, but also to get out there with these ideas before you go with a lot of zeal and excitement and push them forward and really get as much input as possible from both sides of the equation. And I learned a, a really good lesson back then, but uh, I thought I would never have to bring this issue up again. Um, but thank you, Steve Haycox, who did it to me about two <laughs> weeks ago, and thank you for bringing it up. It was easy. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. We now offer each of you an opportunity to ask your opponent a question. Please keep your question brief. You will have uh, one minute uh, to answer the question you're asked, and the person who asked the question will have 30 seconds for rebuttal. We will begin with Mayor Begich. Senator, you talk a lot about clout, but today the most critical issues facing Alaskans is energy. So far with your clout, you have allowed the Enron loophole, which I mentioned earlier tonight, to be slipped into your bill, an appropriation bill, which deregulated our energy markets and cost Alaskans $1.5 billion. You have been stripped of your seniority on your committees. The Republican minority leader has asked, has said with 100% certainty that you will be uh, expelled from the Senate. Isn't it time to be honest with Alaskans that you can no longer deliver for Alaskan <coughs> families? Well, no, that's a nice question, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as a practical matter, I have delivered, notwithstanding the, the, pe the pending circumstances. And as, and as a matter of fact, uh, the, the situation that you mentioned is, is a temporary situation that regards this, these current charges against uh, which I am innocent of and which I believe uh, have been exacerbated by a massive abuse of government po uh, power and, and one that I think will be a, become really a, 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 a study by, from a lot of people as far as the, the legal profession is concerned. But as far as clout, I've never talked about clout. You not talk about clout. I don't talk about clout. I talk about doing my duty. I talk about wor working for Alaskans and fighting for Alaskans. I fought, fight about, I understand you thought that the Denali Commission ought to apply to multi-states. You, you, you seem to misunderstand why it was created. It was created to fill a gap in, in the whole provision of federal assistance to people in rural Alaska. It was not meant to be a, a, a national situation at all. We, we set a, a, a limit on, on expenses for the Denali Commission to, to, at, at a level that was you know, very, lo very low, and it brought money to the state. I hate to interrupt. Mayor Begich, you have 30 seconds. I, I, I guess the question, again, you know, that I asked, and I recognize, and you made the comment that it's a temporary situation. The temporary situation of not being a ranking member and those seniority rankings stripped from you are going to continue until you resolve this issue, which puts Alaska at risk. And that's the fact. And, and every time I hear this issue, it concerns me because Alaska has significant issues and energy crisis, the economic crisis we face, the education issues we face. There are many issues we face, and the time of a person needs to be spent focused on those. Thank you. Senator Stevens, your question for uh, Mayor Thank Baker. you very much for those misstatements, Mr. Mayor. I, I, I'm not going to have to use up my time. Uh, to answer them, to spur us as your ads. You know, when the Republicans put on ads that I didn't like attacking you, I told them to stop it. You have not stopped the ads against me. You had the power to do that. Now, you're, you're, you've said that we need new refinery capacity in Alaska. You supported the Boxen, Boxer Lieberman car carbon swap bill. That would have shut down our refineries. That would have been one of the worst things to, that come, had come to our state, would, would have stopped the gas pipeline, would have stopped the bullet line. But you now stand, you, 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 it would have caused a massive loss of jobs. Now, why did you, why would you come out and support a bill like the Box and Lieberman carbon swap bill? Well, f first off, Senator, I think your uh, view that it would stop all these things in the fear tactic is not really accurate. The, the reality of that piece of legislation, and it wasn't perfect, and I think in a lot of ways, one of the conversations I had with Senator Boxer, she had never even had a conversation with you over this bill. And if we're going to have some impact in making sure the bills work for us, we need to be talking to both sides of the equation. But I disagree with you on that theory that it's going to have a negative 